Okay, now we're heading to the fan commentary of Zoe's Multifilm vs. Non-Dizzy Villains, Round 8. And let's get going. So we start off with the prologue, we see King Piccolo. It's a weird name. Whenever I think of a piccolo, I think of that instrument. You know, King Piccolo restored, has his youth restored and Cell growing more powerful. You mean he wasn't always like this before? Okay, yeah, we get it. Okay, and then we see Pow Pouch and we, and Trinamore raises Barmaly back from the dead. Ah, oh, okay. And he's brought back to life in that different style. Similar to how the Snow Queen did with him in Disney Villains vs. Zoe Multifilm Villains. Barmaly, the cannibal pirate, again, yeah, is back in the round, the war, in a different style. Of course, he tells him what happens because Catawall killed him. Yeah, from what we saw in the previous round. And so, Paul Pouch tells him that he needs to get Catawall as a sacrifice to summon this. Monster? Is that what it says? A powerful monster? That could defeat Shendu? That's interesting. It's like, okay, I'll do it, babies. And then we see at the castle of Lord Malice, we see that something I did suggest. Regina from Red Shoes and the Seven Dwarves. Yeah, I suggested Darth Wool like an idea for this one. Red Shoes and the Seven Dwarves. If you guys have not seen it, I'll leave the link down below. But what I got is a really good movie. And I tried to watch it on my PS3, but for some reason it wouldn't play. So I'll probably get a PlayStation 5 for that one if there, the prices go down. Or maybe when I can go visit one of my relatives, I can finally watch it. So, in this one, Regina is the sister of Lord Malice. Which makes sense, because Red Shoes is basically a retelling of Snow White, while Happily Ever After is basically the sequel to, to you know, the story of Snow White. So he greets his sister. And plus, uh, interesting, but I've always found her as the equivalent to Mother Gothel. And the reason why is because Saber's Bark did point out she's like, you know, kind of like Yzma, but with the style of Mother Gothel. And she acts more like Mother Gothel than Yzma. And I can totally see the, the similar personality. She is so much like Mother Gothel. She's the non-Disney Mother Gothel. And I thought that's cool. So, yeah, I'm just glad to see her in there. That I suggested for her. For him. So, along with her uh, minions, General Asdev and the witch Frida. Huh. Yeah, General Asdev is in this war. Ah, everyone's most favored waifu. Yeah, there's Frida. I also suggested Frida in there. And I like Hook's reaction. He looks all derpy, like, Durr, pretty lady, derpy. And I wonder if the colonel will be just thinking, like, Captain, if you don't... Uh, hold on. I'm getting really... I'm sorry, this is just silly. So, he's probably thinking, like, Captain, if you don't stop looking at any distractions, you're probably going to end up in trouble. Just have dignity, Okay. So, I know that Happily Never After is basically like, well, it's like a, a Shrek knockoff, but I've seen it from Bob Show's review of that one. It is technically a Shrek ripoff, but it's understandable because it has been used in other wars, like Disney vs. Non-Disney Villains Part 3 and Non-Disney Villains Tournament. 
Also, Lord Malice promises his sister, Regina, to restore her youth. Of course. Just like Mother Gothel, Regina is obsessed with youth and beauty. And just sort of watching. Yep, she accepts this offer. And then we see Kind E meet up with his friend, the Sea Dazar. And they both have a conversation that they could, you know, to conquer the ocean. Plus, they decide to train. Transform the sea witch back, but give her a new form, a different form, in a Zoe's multifilm version. The sea witch from the Zoe's multifilm version of the Little Mermaid. If not many people have seen it, I'll probably leave the link down below. Bruh, just like that anime Little Mermaid, it's probably closer to the book. So now she gets to obey every command from them. And then we see this thing, this guy, meets up with Valmont in the Dark Hand, and Shendu possessing Valmont. Interesting, we don't see him start off as a statue. But instead, seeing him possessing Valmont, just like in Season 2 of Jackie Chan Adventures. So what it says is that this dude, Orochimaru, I still need to watch most of Naruto who was the leader of the Akatsuki, that his ninja had found this priest that knows the location of Pao Pouch. I'm not sure if I got that pronounced right. Who has the talisman that Shendu needs. The monkey talisman. <laughs> I'm sure it's not just one talisman, but it's like 12 talismans you need to get. Hmm. Huh. And then, there's something I suggest- Oh, so, sorry. I forgot, there's a change of music. Although, dude, I think you might need to use different themes. I'm just suggesting. So, the idea I suggested to Darth Wulig is that Shere Khan tells him that he's from another dimension. He's not from this dimension, which actually fixed a lot of plot holes and why there's two non-Disney Shere Khans. He's actually from the live-action universe, and the idea is that he's Shere Khan from Mowgli's Brothers. And that is one of my most favorite versions, and sorry, I'm not a fan of the anime, to be honest with you. It looks just too weird. I was hoping that the Jungle Book anime would be something like, uh, something out of a Studio Ghibli, or from A1 Pictures, or something like that. I just wasn't a fan of the animation style. So, the reason he ends up in the hand-drawn realm is because, well, the animated realm, that he and Tabaki found the portal. They both went in there, and that's how they got there. So, yeah, he's actually the Shere Khan from Mowgli's Brothers. If no one has got the, you know, seen it, if you have Netflix, go look, watch it. It's really good, in my opinion. Okay, and now we go for the first fight. We got Soto versus the Prehistoric Beast. Ah, animals from prehistoric times, I see. So, while patrolling the, uh... While patrolling the... Boo Boo's Kingdom. The Boo Boo Kingdom is what it says in the description. So it's just Boo Boo's Kingdom. The hyena was has been spotted by Soto and his pack of saber-toothed tigers. Now, I'm just going to say the saber Two Tigers were one of my favorite parts of this movie. Uh, from Ice Age. Also, interesting enough, one of the saber Two Tigers that, uh, oh, was that they ran into those prehistoric beasts. Ouch! Uh, yikes. And there's another one. I, I think this one is... No, wait. I think that one is being... was actually voiced by Jack Black. If I'm not mistaken. 
I think there was a rumor I heard. Uh, Jack Black played one of the Saber Two Tigers, like that guy. Taking down those prehistoric beasts. Eh. You know, funny enough, they, they deal with the Woolly Mammoth in the first Ice Age, and now they're dealing with the Woolly Mammoth in this war. Ouch. Hey, there's a pack of wolves coming in to save the day. Oh, and there's one of Killer the Tiger's former henchmen, or animal minions, or whatever. Well, the elephant, that is. Huh. The elephant managed to took down a woolly mammoth. So Soto and the other pack wins. The next fight is Red versus Beelzebub. So Lucifer asks Red. I like Red way more than Lucifer. I'm just saying because he's a fictional demon. Tells him to take down one of these most powerful enemies to weaken his faction. And that's Beelzebub. And Red grows into a giant size. Oh, a blast of wind. That's gonna teach him a lesson about, like, oh, big tough kitty, eh? Boom! It's like, I'll show you to mess up with my size. You know, making fun of his size. And he manages to drag him down to the depths. Uh, maybe bees, uh, hell, I guess. Uh, and Beals above wind. <laughs> do kid. Just thought it might, might be what he says. And uh, now for the next fight is uh Naginag Nagina versus Naginakina. Oh, uh, Naginagina were guarding the treasures of the White Cobra. Also, oh, this fight is made by Fattest Cat. Uh, suggested by was it suggested or made by suggested by Fattest Cat is. Oh, yeah, and also I forgot the the part with the sea which becoming the Zoe's multifilm version was suggested by Fattest Caddis. So I almost forgot to mention that. Burr! So they deal with these two Cobras that are also Nag and Nagida. <laughs> we got the ones from Chuck Jones' version of Ricky Tiki Tavi now fighting against the Russian version of. The Cobra from Ricky Tiki Tavi. It's interesting, you gotta admit. Ooh! It's a battle of the Cobras. It's basically what it is a Cobra fight. Two Cobras fighting each other. And that's been forever since I've seen Ricky Tiki Tavi back in Brightner Elementary School. So yeah, the guy who wrote Ricky Tiki Tavi, the, the actual novel, was made by Raw Dog. No, no, wait. Rudyard Kipling, that's who I I don't know how I got the names mixed up. Rudyard Kipling wrote Ricky Tiki Tavi. He's the same guy who did the Jungle Book. The actual Jungle Book, I mean. Okay, we're in the hole. So I guess the story is multi-film, Naki Naki Da wins. I need to rewatch Ricky Tiki Tavi so I can get the names right. And now for the next fight is the Blue Meanies versus the Mongols, made by Scatterbrain Studios. Well, haven't learned that Necron has been captured by the Mongols. The Blue Meanies decide to go rescue him. Well, I guess they like mean villains just as much as they like to be mean, I guess. Yeah, The Yellow Submarine is a very interesting film. <laughs> Plus, it is a good film, just saying. Oh, I didn't think I'm... Okay, I think I'm going to stop right here, so I'll see you guys in the next part of this commentary.